Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the San Francisco's Office of Civic Innovation, I want to thank you all for being with us today for our Civic Bridge Innovation Showcase. Uh, before we get started, I just want to express my sincere appreciation for all of you that have helped make this cohort possible, especially to Jay Lim and Matt Larson from our innovation team. We could not do this without you. This is our sixth year for Civic Bridge, and we are so incredibly grateful for all of our partners that help make this cross sector work possible, both past, present, and maybe even some future. The six cross sector teams that you'll be hearing from today spent the last four months working together virtually to help create tangible solutions for important city challenges. We hope you enjoy hearing about their projects, learning about the impact that they've made, and appreciating the time and energy both city staff and our pro bono partner volunteers have contributed towards helping to make SF better for all of us. We will be joined later um, by Mayor Bree as our keynote speaker, um, but uh, right now, we'll be moving right into our first presentation. So I'm going to introduce my colleague, Jane Lim, to kick us off. Thank you again, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Steve, for your opening and inspiring words. Um, as you mentioned, Civic Bridge is a testament to what can happen when you bring different people together to collaborate on and tackle sort of challenges and better serve our residents in San Francisco. Um, and we have a great showcase for everyone here today with six public-private partnership teams who will share their specific challenges, their project journeys, and visions for the future. Um, each team will share their project in a six-minute flash talk presentation. And for those of you who are watching, please feel free to ask any questions or share your thoughts in the YouTube comment section during the team's presentations. We'd love to hear what resonates with you um, and what you're interested in learning more about. So now let's go ahead and hear from our first Civic Bridge project team. I'd like to introduce our speakers, Daniel Sanchez and Paul Chang from the San Francisco's Office of Contract Administration, and Liz Gower from Zendesk, who will share their work towards simplifying city bidding and contract compliance processes to help businesses do business with the city. Uh, Daniel, Paul, and Liz, over to you. Thank you very much, Shane. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Sanchez and I am a principal analyst with the Office of Contract Administration uh, and our uh, project was a part of our, our project partner was Zendesk and um, here today, unfortunately, we couldn't have our director, Taylor Zuccarella, uh, but we do have other members of our team uh, with us today. We have Paul Chang, who was a co-lead with myself uh, on this project, also a principal analyst with OCA. And from our partners at Zendesk, we have our project lead, uh, Liz Gower. Um, and so our office works on procurement of services and commodities that are essential for departments to carry out their duties. And so our project was around uh, the city's procurement process. And Paul? Oh. Hey, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. OC was paired with a great team from Zendesk, including Liz. Jamie, Amy, Caleb, Kylie, and Pablo, uh, who brought a wide and, and diverse variety of skills and expertise to bear on this project. Okay, and so what was the challenge that our project was trying to address? Uh, if any of you have ever dealt with uh, cities bidding and contracting process, you know that the city places a lot of requirements on the companies that bid on and eventually get contract awards. Uh, we have a lot of requirements that we place on them. Some are procedural, such as, you know, getting a supplier ID or filling out bid documents. And some are more uh, substantive, such as uh, complying with insurance requirements or the city's equal benefits ordinance. And also, all of these requirements are managed by different entities within the city. Uh, there's no one singular source of, uh, of authority or help that the debaters can go to. Uh, and also, these uh, requirements can be confusing. Uh, there are a lot, and there are a lot of forms that we ask them to, to fill out on uh, different uh, formats. And so our goal was to uh, do some research into uh, the debating process so that we can find a way to untangle uh, the process for the companies that want to do business with the city. And so that is what we set out to do with Zendesk. And so now I'm going to hand it over to our project lead from Zendesk, Liz Gower. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel. Next slide. 
Awesome. Uh, so as mentioned, when we first started off this project, there was a couple different angles that OCA wanted to hit. So we started our project with a Miro t-shirt exercising uh, whiteboard activity to really drive to what the key deliverables were going to be here. Um, and along with OCA, we really discovered that the key deliverables were going to be interviews with other city stakeholder departments, as well as a survey out to suppliers and bidders. Uh, that's really focused on two small local businesses. So from there, we went right into the interviews with the four other stakeholder departments, then using those interview learnings uh, along with a couple rounds of feedback with the OCA team, we went ahead and launched the survey. That was live for two weeks in July, uh, and we received 248 responses. From there, we did a thorough analysis with both qualitative and quantitative feedback, uh, and passed over a full analysis deck to OCA, uh, and that led into our final recommendations, that, which we'll talk about uh, a little more about later. Um, but really, that includes uh, future action for OCA and then concept designs for a contractor's assistance center. Next slide, please. So some of the key insights that we learned about during this project uh, were really similar to what Daniel and Paul had mentioned. Uh, internal process improvement was super, super important, and all the city's stakeholder departments were really excited to partner together to work on some of those internal processes. Second is that we learned that bidders and suppliers knowing about compliance did not actually mean that they know how to comply or where to go to find info about compliance. And then last, I think was really, really interesting. Uh, as Zenisk approached this uh, project, we considered suppliers, bidders, and additional stakeholder departments all to be OCA's customers. And this has led to OCA viewing themselves in a similar way, which is just a great opportunity to really redefine how uh, they, uh, their processes and how they function as a team. Awesome. And so here we just got a little bit of an insight, um, part of the, uh, the handoff uh, deliverables that we had for OCA. Uh, so around compliance, as you can see, uh, around 43% uh, of our responders said that they know how to be a compliance supplier. However, 57% said that they know how to submit a compliant bid. So as you can see, there's definitely a difference here in people uh, and bidders and suppliers actually understanding the requirements. And the next slide. And so then along with those uh, actual quantitative insights, we went ahead and paired some qualitative feedback that we received from, um, from the respondents as well. Um, and so this was really all focused around the small uh, and local businesses. Awesome, and next slide. And then finally, here we've got our solution deliverables. So working with OCA, uh, the four key activities that we've identified for them are really working to establish and track KPIs, um, thinking about and re-looking at their engagement tactics for suppliers and bidders and how they really get people uh, to be excited about these opportunities, centralize, put all of that info in one place, and then of course, build out this one-stop shop uh, or the Contractors Assistance Center. Next slide. And so then we just wanted to share with uh, with y'all just some of the designs that uh, we'd passed over to OCA for that one-stop shop contract assistance center, uh, as well as what the bidder support, supplier portal could look like. Great. And then uh, from here, I will hand it back over to Daniel and Paul. Thank you all so much uh, on behalf of Zendesk. It was great working with y'all. Thank you, Liz. Uh, so while we as a city have a ways to go to implement these recommended improvements, project has had several very critical impacts. First, the project has allowed us to bring key city stakeholders together to kickstart a collaborative process for making improvements to our procedures and systems. Most critically, and through this project, we began communicating with our stakeholder departments about our common challenges with the bidding and contracting process. Secondly, while we had a general sense of what the challenges might be for bidders and suppliers, the project allowed us to gain direct feedback from these entities, who we now see as our customers. This analysis is incredibly useful as we work to further determine which recommendations would have the greatest impact and should be prioritized. Ultimately, what Zendesk team, provi Zendesk team provided was a roadmap for process improvements. With our new shared understanding of the key challenges and the critical improvements that are needed, we believe we'll see continued participation and commitment from our sister departments. And we now have a set of clear recommendations and next steps for implementation. We're very excited to begin sharing out what we learned with our stakeholder city departments so we can get buy-in on the recommendations and begin strategically implementing the high priority process improvements. So on be behalf of this OCA team, we want to say thank you to the Zendaz team and the Civic Bridge for helping us move this important initiative forward. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Daniel, Paul, and Liz for taking us on your project journey and sharing with us the impact of work that came out of your collaboration. Um, we'll now hear from our next project. Um, I'd like to introduce Darton Ito at, the, at SFMTA and Sarah Wang, co-lead of the CS Associates volunteer team. Uh, this team worked on developing dashboards to help ensure equitable access to ride-sharing services for people using wheelchairs. Darton and Sarah, please come up to the virtual stage. Thanks, Shane. Uh, I'm Dart Nito with the San Francisco Municipal Transport Agen Agency, and with me is Sarah Wang, who was project lead for ZS Associates. We're here to share our project, which was to visualize TNC access for all data. First, I'd like to introduce our team. So on one side, we have the ZS Associates team. The other, we have the city and county of San Francisco, represented by SFMTA, along with the San Francisco County Transportation Authority, and uh, with support from the Office of Civic Innovation. Uh, next. So the challenge, um, many of you may have used Uber or Lyft to get from work, get home from a restaurant, or to make other trips, but have you ever wondered if someone using a wheelchair is able to use these services? Well, back in 2018, the TNC Access for All Act was signed into law this bill requires transportation network companies such as Uber and Lyft to pay a per trip fee that can be used to pay for the cost of providing on demand mobility services that meet the needs of persons with disabilities. So over the last year and a half or a little bit longer, the TNCs have been reimbursed a lot of money for reporting that they have met the performance requirements uh, required by the TNC Access for All Act. However, we found that the reports are not easily legible or transparent to the public. So what we sought was to find a better way to analyze these reports. Uh, we wanted to create a better data structure that would allow us to generate visual displays of the information, better understand how wheelchair accessible services are being provided by the TNCs in the state of California. We wanted to eliminate the need for one-off one analyses and be able to develop deeper insights, such as to see trends uh, over time, all with the goal of making the data easier to use and understand by members of the public. On this next slide, here's just a sample of one, one of the reports from one of, one of the companies that, that's reporting. This is just one portion of that. And um, you can see off to the right that this is just one tab in a series of tabs. Uh, there's over a dozen reports that are required in all. And given the volume of information and the way that it's presented, it was really difficult for us to draw any conclusions about how the service is being provided. So now I'd like to turn it over to Sarah to describe how we, how we sought to um, approach our project. Thanks, Starton. Yes, as you saw from that data display, um, our first order of business was just to dive in and understand the problem. I think given that this is a legislative law, um, it was really important for us to understand the act that was um, published and map out the metrics that defined in there where we needed to go. So we reviewed all the historical data, finding and logging any data errors along the way, and ultimately understood a clear path of where we needed to go and how we would get there. Once we mapped out that portion of it, we then spent a good chunk of time consolidating the data into one workable format that would work nicely with Tableau to create the data visualizations that we knew we would need. And we actually had the opportunity to build two different versions of the dashboard, one for internal SFMTA use and one to share out with the public to build transparency and trust between the city and its citizens. Last, we wanted to make sure that SFMTA could maintain the data by themselves. And so we shared our Tableau expertise through a very detailed data transformation guide that kind of outlined step-by-step -step how SFMTA could continue to update the data quarterly and make that process as seamless as possible. So with that, I'll actually hop over to what the dashboard looks like and give you a live view. You can see here, we have multiple tabs on the top here explaining information about the trips, the response time, expenses, complaints, and outreach. All of this is data that every TNC is providing quarter over quarter. On the trips page, you can very quickly see 
what Darton was talking about, we can visualize now quarter over quarter data. Um, what I wanna highlight here is that you can see that across the state of California, there were about 2,800 completed trips. That's about 53% of the trips requested. And we can also filter down to whatever county of interest, but if we go to San Francisco, it's really cool to see that the vast majority of those trips were completed in San Francisco, about a thousand of that 2,800. And here, I think it's also really powerful to see kind of the impact of COVID. We saw dramatic decreases in ridership and things that um, make intuitive sense by looking at something more visual as opposed to the spreadsheets we were looking at at the start of this presentation. So in addition to just trip information, we have some basic information about supply and demand. And then, like I said, all these other components of what the data could tell us um, to make assessing TNC performance easier for uh, SFMTA. Thanks, Sarah. So we were excited by the opportunity to aware, raise awareness of the state of wheelchair accessible services that are being provided by transportation network companies in each of the counties in California. What we're doing next is to finalize the set of dashboards that we can share with the public um, and hope that they're used by advocacy groups and other city and county agencies. Uh, we feel that with the foundation that the ZS Associates team has laid, that city staff will be able to update and maintain the dashboards as each subsequent quarter's data is reported. Uh, finally, we have met with the California Public Utilities Commission staff who are responsible for implementing this program and hope that this effort has inspired them to develop similar content for this and other transportation programs they manage. With that, I'd like to thank, thank you all for um, hearing our story. Thank you to Sarah and the ZS Associates team and thanks to the OCI team for um, including us in this program. Thank you, Darren and Sarah, for sharing your amazing work on equity and transportation. Uh, next up, we have Ryan Sapinoso from the Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families, and Nikhil Jain from Adobe, who will talk about their project on improving communications and engagement with San Francisco youth and their families. Uh, Ryan, Nikhil, turning it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Jane. Hi, everyone. So as you just heard from Jane, the main goal of our project was effectively communicating these services to families that DCYF works with. But as part of our pro project, we also wanted to see how we could bring together data, technology, and internal processes within DCYF to make the organization more digitally mature. So that's kind of what we're talking about here when we say advancing digital maturity. It's bringing together these different aspects to make sure that as we go forward, all of the outreach, all of the data strategy that we conduct is improved upon, iterated, and creates a robust feedback loop where families are really involved in improving the next outreach they receive. So with that in mind, I'm just quickly introducing the team. So from the Adobe side, we had Karina, Jacob, Isabel, and myself representing four different teams and really different ways of thinking. And I'll pass it over to Ryan to introduce the DCYF side. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Ryan Sapinos here from DCYF, uh, part of the project team with Sarah and Dory from our data eval and communications teams. Um, and yeah, just before Nikhil digs deeper into our pro uh, project journey, um, just some quick working context or background on DCYF, I think would help. Um, so uh, yeah, about DCYF on an annual basis, we grant about $150 million to around 400 programs housed under roughly 150 CBOs citywide. Um, it is a pretty significant allocation of resources and we're intent on making sure that the services we fund effectively support the city's highest need communities. Um, so when we're talking about digital maturity and advancing that at DCYF, our intent really is to um, strengthen our ability to align grant making with the voices of parents and young, young folks who can easily go unheard and without civic engagement in public agencies. Um, so DCYF is really excited to partner with Adobe for the Civic Bridge project to reflect and strategize around deepening our digital engagement, um, especially as we're embarking on a new planning process for the next cycle. Um, and also because digital engagement is really the biggest option available to us given the context of the current pandemic. Um, so that said, um, back to Nikhil. Awesome. 
Thank you, Ryan. So summarizing a lot of what Ryan shared, we've put together the objectives at the top of the slide here around awareness and engagement, reaching the most in-need populations, and also developing this feedback loop. And we understood these objectives to translate into specific digital priorities around consolidating profiles for each family, such that when we send outreach, whether it's email, text, or in other forms, it's actually tailored to their specific needs, whether that's neighborhood, age of their kids, what they're looking for, et cetera. But also internally, it's about having a data-driven organization where all of these metrics are tied to clear success factors that we'll dive a little deeper into. So briefly just flashing the timeline, it was over 16 weeks, and we took an iterative approach where using our weekly check-ins, we managed to iterate on each deliverable until it was as relevant as possible to DCYF. We did include some key learnings from our team here. So Karina and Isabel noticed that these problems are obviously very complex and challenging. If they weren't, they would have been solved already. And so it really was worth you know, taking that extra time to understand the problem before diving into design. So specifically looking at the community needs assessment, which is the planning process that Ryan spoke to, we took the sample persona of Marsha, who goes through a series of steps where she's learning about DCYF, she's sharing information in the form of a survey. But because there's not necessarily a clear outreach strategy at the moment, there may be gaps in this overall outreach. So she may not receive a follow-up. And if she returns to DCYF, there may be no way to recognize that this is the same family with the same needs coming back. So with that in mind, we put together what we see as a future journey for the same persona across the same set of stages, except that there's a couple of key differences here. So for instance, you know, the emails, the text messages she receives are a lot more tailored to her need. It's based on the neighborhood she lives in. It's based on the age of her kids. And there's various other capabilities highlighted at the bottom of the slide that we won't go into detail into, but the technical implementation is also where Adobe was guiding the process. That said, one of the learnings here was that the procurement process for new technology can sometimes be a real roadblock, uh, maybe particularly in government, but in other industries as well. So sometimes the best solution is looking at an existing process and learning how to streamline it. With all this in mind, we also did want to make sure that we're not just offering technical guidance, but actually putting into place a framework for what digital maturity looks like so that DCYF can continue returning to these metrics and see how they're tracking against progress. So this is a unique Adobe uh, framework that looks at people, process, and technology. And we had DCYF rank themselves. So 15 stakeholders took a survey, ranking the organization on a scale of one to five across these 12 metrics. And you, know, you see DCYF in red, we see the industry benchmark in gray. And we learned here that a lot of these, in a lot of these areas, DCYF is on par or even ahead. And one of the key learnings on my part was that as we adjust it for each industry, we want to make sure we're dropping buzzwords and making it as relevant as possible. We did want to make sure that rather than just leaving 12 metrics to sort of work with, we actually um, prioritize them on a scale of impact on the organization against effort to transform. So specifically looking at the quick wins, looking at how someone like Marsha can have clear next steps defined for her on the back end so that when we send follow-up emails and other messaging, the messaging, there's a clear set of what comes next and how do we guide her to it. With that in mind, I'll pass it back to Ryan to quickly share how these different use cases and metrics will be in effect in a crawl, walk, run for DCYF. Thanks, Adele. So yeah, going through that matrix, um, it really provided DCYF with an ability to plan forward. I think we would start with uh, crawling into some internal conversations. So you know, defining the user journey is definitely a place for us um, as DCYF staff to initiate conversations on you know. Uh, with a with a journey that Adobe's proposed, um, is this something we want to refine? Is this something we're going to adapt? You know, there's some internal reflection that needs to be had, so we can really think of strengthening our ability to treat members of the public less as you know single points in time snapshots of input for our plans, and more ongoing partners for our planning and uh, grant making. Um, alongside that, there would you know be the ability to walk into technical solutions. Um, Adobe's been working through refinements for a um, uh, data collect data stakeholder engagement platform, um, Civica Engage, uh, that would allow us to really clean up a bunch, uh, a bunch of our digital needs. Um, so that would help us clarify analytics visibility, um, collect actual information, um, helpful for communications campaigns. Uh, so with that technical solution in place, we can then run into new pieces like marketing toolkits, 
um, and better digital insights for again continuously improving our um, outreach efforts. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Um, thank you again to Adobe and team for the solid just listening and exploration and insights you're equipping with us. Uh, you're equipping us with and thank you again to everybody online with us for just tuning into our work thank you all thank you ryan akil uh it's so wonderful to hear about the amazing work this project team has done towards uh better engagement with our resident youth and families um next up we'll hear from deborah Bell from the department of homelessness and supportive housing and david Romero from zendesk who will share their work on developing a video to help make san franciscans more aware of not just the crisis of homelessness but also the solutions so deborah david over to you thanks jane hi my name is deborah bauk and i am the community and communications lead for the department of homelessness and supportive housing and i use she her pronouns um, the starting point for us was the fact that San Francisco is in the middle of an affordability crisis. App approximately 8,000 people are unhoused in San Francisco. The mission of the Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing is to make homelessness rare, brief, and one time. Our challenge was to, to make both sheltered and unsheltered residents of the city help them understand that there is a system of care in place called the Homelessness Response System designed to resolve problems and help people exit homelessness. The pandemic has reinforced for us that, home, that housing is not only the solution to homelessness, but is also healthcare. In order to amplify the work of the department and our nonprofit partners, we created a video with Zendesk that focuses on the city's homelessness response system and its six core components. I'll now turn it over to our partner at Zendesk for more details on the, on the project. Hello everyone, I'm David Fumero with Zendesk. I'll be touching base on the following points. The approach, key insights, our exciting moment, and the learnings. The Zendesk team's approach was to better understand the problem the city was looking to solve to get the right people in place and collaborate with the city of the, for the entire process. We learned that the city has many programs in place to support many of those in need, but needed our support to convey those resources to a wider audience. We helped them design a new video concept to share more about the work being done at HSH. What really shaped our project was getting a firm understanding of the audience of this video and clarifying our message. We at Zendesk were witnessing firsthand the homelessness issue around our 989 market location on a daily basis. With the help of HSH, we were able to learn more about the many resources dedicated to addressing the homeless issues and were able to use our creative skills to create a video concept that helps tell that story. There were a lot of great moments during our collaboration with HSH, but one thing that stands out is the first time we saw the rough cut of the video. The video had been in our minds conceptually for weeks, but seeing it take concrete form was incredible. We were able to take a real life situation with Brenda and show the transition from homelessness to supportive housing. And not only did we learn more about stories like Brenda's and HSH's homeless response system, we also learned a lot about the government during our collaboration. While the challenges our counterparts in this public sector face are different at the surface level, they share a number of core similarities with the work we do. We aim to serve our customers. Throughout the process, we have learned more about the work that HSH does on a daily basis to support this homeless crisis that is very overwhelming. We also learned that the city and its nonprofit partners operate a robust homeless response system. Our Zendus team would like to thank the HSH team and the city of San Francisco for allowing us to participate in the Civic Bridge project. This video is going live today and we'd now like to present it to the showcase group here.
Thank you for being part of the debut of our video. Today, we will launch on several social media channels as well as our website. So please, if you would follow us at SF underscore HSH uh, and let us know what you think. Um, we'd love to hear from you. I'm gonna turn it back over to my partner at Zendesk, David. David, I think you're on mute. Again, our Zendesk team would like to thank the HSS team and the city of San Francisco for allowing us to participate in the Civic Bridge project. Um, it was definitely a fun project for us to be a part of and looking forward to doing more in the future. Thank you, Deborah and David. I absolutely love the video and huge kudos to Zendesk and HSH for creating such an amazing and thoughtful product. Uh, next up, we have Ronica Chu from Our Children, Our Families, part of the Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families, and Rajiv Tiwari from Salesforce, who will talk about their work in promoting awareness of children's rights in San Francisco. Ronica, Rajiv, take it away. Thanks so much, Jane. Hi all, my name is Veronica Chu. I am a senior analyst with the Department of Children, Youth, and Their Families. I was one of the city partners for a Civic Bridge project between the Our Children, Our Families team, which is actually a team within DCYF, and Salesforce. Um, I'm joined here today by Rajiv Tiwari, who is one of our project managers on the Salesforce side of things. Um, and he'll get, to get a chance to introduce himself in a sec. So our challenge, as Jane mentioned, was to create a citywide communications plan to promote awareness of children's rights in San Francisco. Given the onset of multiple social and public health emergencies of the past year, from the pandemic to racism to climate change and wildfires, we knew that centering the needs and voices of children and youth as one of the most highly impacted and vulnerable populations would be especially important to respond to and recover from these challenges. So earlier last year, um, the Our Children, Our Families team had partnered with UNICEF to launch their Child Friendly Cities Initiative, which supports local governments in protecting the rights of children and young people in the city. While San Francisco has a long and robust history of efforts to ensure that every child and their needs are met, um, we didn't have a way to talk about this work using a rights-based framework to the broader community. We were limited by a lack of staffing capacity and resources, and except for a single local press release that we did pre-COVID, um, we didn't have a communication strategy or plan in place. Next slide, please. We wanted to find a way to start talking about this very global idea of children's rights in a way that made sense in our local context, which is where our Civic Bridge partners um, at Salesforce came in. And as you can see from the slide here, we had a very globally distributed team um, spread out all over the world, uh, comprised of members from Salesforce, UNICEF USA, and the city and county of San Francisco, all of whom brought a unique and diverse skill set and lens to the challenge. And now I'll turn it over to Rajiv to speak about the work that happened. Thank you, Veronica. And first of all, let me just make a big thank you for DCYF, OCF team, Jane and Elsa for putting together this wonderful team. My name is Rajiv Tiwari. I work in internal operations in Salesforce. And inside Salesforce, other than the work we deliver for our customers, one thing everyone is proud of is our culture of giving back. And there was nothing but an opportunity to get a chance to give back to our home base, that's San Francisco. And as uh, Venka, you mentioned that we got a quite a good amount of uh, truly good global team here from different aspects, different uh, part of the world. And that brought up the key skill set that we need to deliver that uh, DCY was needing for, primarily about marketing communication and a way to develop the partnership and some project development. So from there on, how did we tackle the problem that you mentioned? So uh, Veronica mentioned our three key problems about the need of a communication and uh, lack of the resources that DCYF or OCOF was uh, is struggling to bring uh, stronger communication channels and uh, execute those. So from that point, our main area was uh, to first of all, just to make sure we have a good alignment with the different team members or different teams and collect the data that's required for building any good strategy and then put into the program and the toolkit that DCYF can use. 
So while we went on uh, the basic aspect of any communication project is communication is not only about what you say, it's also about what other end is looking for. So two end of any communication, here the city is one end of the communication, second end is the communication who receive the messages. So we identified very early on, we had to be very clear, we need to know what those audience might be looking for, making sure we can make a right connection during the communication. So we put a strong focus on data, gathering the data and capturing the insights so we can build the right communication model. We're building the partnership program and putting together a content and strategic plan that TCYF can use it not for just this project, but even for a long term. And when we come for the first part of trying to get to know the data, we had a different set of interviews and surveys that we conducted, mainly went about talking to children, talking to parents. It was really wonderful talking to pre-teens and teens and see how they see child-friendly cities, how they see what our children's rights are. And we collected tons of data on it. So quite a good amount of data went into building this program itself. I thought to highlight one of the areas where how people see what the child friendly city look like. So with that, uh, we come up with quite a different set of information or the tool set that DCYF would need. So connect to the three main area that DCYF was running around. One thing was about their communication tool set that what and how or what kind of communication to make. Limited bandwidth, how to run the communication that most of the industry uses 50s, 100, and a lot of resources of people sitting up doing the communication. How do DCYF and OCF run that with a short, like a limited set of staff? So the solution came that we should build a good partnership model. City has a lot of partners that they work with, whether communication, transportation, uh, private uh, suppliers in the city. There are a lot of partners who will be more than happy to join the cause. So we put together quite a good amount of uh, resources and toolkits so city can execute, track their engagement, how to measure the success of the partnership, and put together a good amount of calendars, how to run our program. So those were two highly, but quite a good amount of tools that, that were put together. And one focus that was we had from the day one, we aren't just delivering to make this project success, but we are also delivering or enabling DCYF. They can run the similar project in future using the same tools and skills. With that, while we were going over these uh, generating tools, kit, generating content, we also identified some of the recommendations that DCYF can make use in their future project and they'll have done. Mainly about how to engage the communication from early on, build a pipeline and also if they require some expertise outward they can have it on their board with that i'll hand over it to veronica to bring how this project impacts city in general or this department thank you so much rajiv yeah so there were a number of big impacts and takeaways for us um one of the biggest ones was just the amount of capacity building that happened for the ocof team during the sessions we all came in with very little or no marketing and communications background um, to really developing that muscle and learning from the experts on the Salesforce side to get us up and running. One other key impact that I wanted to highlight is that the data discovery phase for us was incredibly powerful. Um, prior to working with the Salesforce team, as I mentioned, we only had one press release completed, but the data discovery phase helped us uncover really the multitude of channels and assets that we could possibly tap into from social media to other types of media, um, assets that we didn't really realize we had. And this would be done primarily through a reliance on um, partners and being able to build a robust partnership engagement plan. And additionally, the data discovery phase gave us an understanding of how to craft and measure um, baseline metrics that would be important to collect in order for us to measure the success of our outreach and partnerships. Um, and as Rajiv hinted at, the Salesforce team was able to create a series of partnership engagement templates, as well as a communications content calendar. Um, these were a set of discrete items that we could very easily take and plug into our department's broader communications and engagement strategy. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, I just wanted to end on a call to action to our audience. Um, if our presentation here has piqued your interest in children's rights, we strongly encourage you to check out this site. 
um, to get involved with the initiative. Or if you're interested in um, any further questions, uh, feel free to connect with me. My email address is here uh, listed here on the slide. Thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, team. And uh, now I have the great honor of introducing our keynote for today, Mayor Breed. We are so excited that she is able to join us and help uh, launch our showcase event today. So if you guys can please join me, please join me in welcoming her to the virtual stage, Mayor Breed. Well, thank you. I didn't realize I was keynoting. I um, appreciate being here to just, you know, witness some of the great innovative projects. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful having worked in San Francisco government for quite some time now. I know firsthand how difficult it is to be innovative in the public sector just because of the layers of bureaucracy sometimes that make it impossible to do simple things with new modern technologies. Sometimes though we have to get a little creative, but if we have learned anything from the past year and a half, it is that when we prioritize getting people the information and resources they need and cut away at the red tape and bureaucracy, we can create incredible change in our communities. During COVID, we've had to find new ways to serve our residents, especially those who are most vulnerable. We found new ways to communicate with people and make sure that they get the information and resources they needed in a culturally competent, easy to understand way. We worked together to reimagine how we deliver services and found innovative new ways to support San Franciscans. Like our community learning hubs, our food and grocery distribution programs, how we created testing and vaccine distribution systems from scratch, connecting people with volunteer opportunities, or how we launched our shared spaces and slow streets in our neighborhoods and commercial corridors. While I am deeply proud of all that we've accomplished as a city, especially over this past year, we know that we still face a lot of challenges. This pandemic exposed the inequities that have plagued our city and our country for generations. It showed us how much we desperately need to make sure people have access to services and how much we need to grow those resources. And in order to do this, we need projects, just like the ones you presented today, that get to the basic functions of government and how our residents interact with city programs and services, because it should not be a headache to apply for housing, open a small business, or simply find help when someone needs it. When we come together to push past the status quo and find new solutions to the most challenging issues of our time, we make our city better for everyone. And I gotta tell you, just to give you context of you know, my own experiences and how excited you should be about the work that you're doing um, and how much it's needed, just think about it. Over 20, 30 years ago, when I used to catch Muni, I was talking about this because it's transit week in San Francisco. When I was taking Muni, we had no knowledge, no understanding, no schedule, no app, no technology to tell us when the next bus was coming. We Everything was a guesstimate. And in most cases, those guesstimates would not always come through. And so we would just have to figure it out. And now we have apps and other things that tell us when buses are coming, when they're predicted to come, how there's a backup at a particular location, like things that we didn't know about then because we didn't have the technology. And so when I think about where we were then and how we are now, we just only get better with time. We get better with time because we have people who are smart, who are innovative, who understand technology, who understand the need to make things better, who are willing to invest the time and resources into making things better for our city, better for our residents, so that we can now just pull it up on our phone or there's a screen that shows us when the next bus might arrive. I wanna thank all of you for participating. Thank you to the partners who have generously donated their time to this program. Thank you to Zendesk, to ZS Associates, to Adobe, Salesforce, and Accenture. Thank you to the many city departments and employees who dedicated their time and efforts to creating these new solutions. And finally, thank you to DEE and the Office of Civic Innovation for continuing this program building these relationships with our partners and driving the spirit of collaboration in our government 
it really is amazing. And it is how we are gonna bring the technology and the works of our city to the 21st century. As we continue our economic recovery and even beyond that recovery, I'm looking forward to seeing more work like this across our city, more innovation, more partnerships and opportunities for fresh, simple ideas to make government and our services more accessible for all San Franciscans. So I hope you will all continue to work with us towards this vision. So thank you every month. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mayor Breed, for your inspiring words. Um, it really does capture the ethos of our Civic Bridge program to help empower the city to be more responsive, inventive, and collaborative for San Franciscans. Um, and as you mentioned, it's so amazing to see what happens when you bring the public and private sectors together to uh, work together to drive change civically, collaboratively, and creatively. Um, with that, I would love to introduce our last but not least project team. Uh, we're going to hear from Catherine McGuire from the San Francisco Police Department and Regina Zamuzinas from Accenture, who will share their work on developing tools to integrate change initiatives into SFPD's strategic plan. So Catherine and Regina, please come up to the virtual stage. Thank you, Jane, and always a tough act to follow uh, the mayor of San Francisco. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I am Catherine McGuire. I'm the executive director of the Strategic Management Bureau of the San Francisco Police Department. Uh, it was a position created by Chief Scott to unify sort of the resources necessary um, to coordinate and uh, implement change in the police department. So we've been in the process of implementing USDOJ reforms for the last five years or so. And uh, as we neared the 90% completion rate, we realized um, we needed to then turn our attention to an internally driven um, source of change set by community expectations and our strategic plans that were um, sort of suggested by the US DOJ for creation. We had about four of those and we needed to align those strategic plans um, and their individual recommendations to our department wide strategic vision and framework. And so with that, we needed a little bit of help to do that. And so Accenture came in and I will hand it off to Regina to let her talk a little bit more about it. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, so Regina Jamuizinas, I was the lead on the Accenture side of our collaborative endeavor here. Um, so we really worked in the first couple of weeks alongside SPD to understand really what was at the core um, of some of these challenges, especially focusing on internally within the organization and a lot of these changes and what that was doing to um, kind of the culture and how that was impacting folks at SFPD. So we took kind of a, a four pronged approach. We were lucky to have a rather large team. Um, the first area we focused on was what we called our initiative inventory and prioritization tool. Um, so this was really a way to, at a very detailed level, tie individual changes and things that SFPD was doing to some of these larger DOJ initiatives and strategic goals as an organization. Um, secondly, we had our change management charter and related tools and templates that we created. So this was meant to be a framework um, that SFPD can use to uh, implement future changes effectively and clearly as an organization. The tools and templates were really supportive of that uh, change management charter, specific templates and documents to help engage stakeholders, track these changes, and develop communication plans and strategies. And then finally, uh, we are actually still working on um, our video, which you'll see a snippet of at the end here today. Uh, and this is an internal communication tool that will be shared with SFPD um, to kind of discuss, uh, you know, a lot, you know, address the changes that have been going on, share what we've done in this in this program a little bit, and. Um, kind of a call to action and thank you to um, officers and staff at SFPD to you know, get involved with the changes and that more changes will come. So going into some highlights and aha moments, I won't get into too much detail here because I'll cover the interviews and workshops on the next two slides. Um, but really the key thing was um, the openness and having difficult conversations, albeit mostly virtually with various uh, folks at SFPD it really just highlighted their passion to serve the community and um, willingness to want to further um, grow um, and develop the, the organization. So we first uh, kicked off 37 30-minute 30 virtual interviews with various officers and staff at SFPD. 
Um, and through those interviews, we were able to kind of distill a lot of the feedback and thoughts that we got into three key personas that highlight where folks are with regards to all the changes that have been going on, how they're impacted, what would they would like to see and kind of where they want to be. So with this feedback, we were able to hold an in-person workshop actually at SFPD headquarters. And we're taking, we took a collaboration, lovely to see folks in person, um, a rare occurrence of this last year. Um, and here's kind of a snippet of our, our final deliverables. I'll hand it off to, to Catherine um, again here. Thanks again, Regina. Um, so the excellent thing, and Regina touched on this, was about this project and Accenture in particular, was their ability to really identify, you know, we came in with this big need and they were ready to tackle that, but then they identified other needs and adjusted the scope accordingly and realized that they needed to deliver, or they wanted to deliver some additional materials or additional deliverables. And so those are the ones outlined on the screen. And those deliverables really serve as our playbook for change um, in the department. So that even if we don't go through every step on the in each of these um, playbooks, um, we have at least thought of them. Um, and so, and thought about how they are relevant. So further, really the process that Accenture uh, ran, engaging our internal membership, both illuminated and demonstrated uh, some key and easy adjustments that SFPD leadership could make in order to engage our personnel through change, engage them and incorporate their feedback in change. Um, representative of that feedback, things like a desire for recognition, a way to contribute to changes. We needed to find a way to communicate that change in general, what has happened, how they've we've been thankful for them and what our um our um sort of communicate three things so our gratitude for the unbelievable amount of change they've absorbed in the last five years and done so with great success uh that we will continue to be making change and that they are the future of sfpd and we need their input as a result and so regina has a short video to from our video um, to show uh, just that. This is our collective work, but everybody has a responsibility and a role. What I want everybody to remember is this. Um, this is your department. This is your future. And you have more power than many of you think that you have to shape your own future. We listen to you. We hear you. And we have to do more of that. The future is yours. It really is. And believe me, you have more power than what you think. Uh, we've gone through a lot of change in this department in the last four and a half, five years, and there's a lot more to come. But so I'll just wrap up here. Um, it was just a snippet, like we said, of our video. Um, big thanks to the team. Um, and I'll hand it back over to you, Jane. Thank you, Catherine, Regina, for sharing your thoughtful work. Um, I am so excited to see SFPD take change management to the next step. Um, and, you know, so just to uh, close out the program, we've heard a lot about these impactful and innovative Civic Bridge projects. Um, and I hope those of you in the audience were as inspired as I was about what can happen when there's public private partnerships and how we can drive civic change together uh, when we work together. Um, if you're interested in learning more about our projects or about future opportunities to collaborate with the Office of Civic Innovation, uh, we encourage you to sign up for our newsletter on our website at innovation.sfgov.org. Uh, again, that's innovation.sfgov.org. Uh, and finally, let me end this celebratory event with big, big gratitude to our Civic Bridge cohort who spent the last four months working together, uh, thinking creatively and dedicating their skills and expertise to once again, drive that civic change in San Francisco. So thank you to our project teams. Uh, thank you to our audience for tuning in to our Civic Bridge Innovation Showcase and have a great day, everyone. Stay well. <laughs>